TJ, man, thank you so much for joining me for this. Uh, mate, I, I first became aware of MOAS, obviously working with the guys at WealthMed, and I had no idea that, that, um, that there was kind of an in-house aspect to this. So I wanted to, when I heard about sort of um, what the tool was doing and how it was being created, it really piqued my interest. But when we sat down and talked about the, the specific timing results that you got in this case, and I started to have a look at it, I just thought um, it was something I really wanted to get this opportunity to talk with you about and sort of demonstrate it to other people. Um, let's start at the beginning. Like, how did, how did it come about? How, how did you go from wherever you were to, to building something like this? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, we started in-house with WealthMed. So uh, all cards on the table. Uh, Carolyn Binden that works at WealthMed, she's my mom. So as all good things did, it started with a really furious conversation over a glass of wine about just how difficult it was to get things done. They were like, you know, we're, we're producing documents out of Excel. And I was like, can, can you even do that? Can you produce PDFs out of Excel? You know, I, I knew a bit of Visual Basic, but I was like, this sounds nuts, right? Uh, obviously, there's other tools out there and other ways of doing things, but it was sort of finding the right way for them to give their advice and, and turn that into a, a tool that as the practice grows, it, it becomes consistent throughout the whole business. So there were a lot of pain points that led up to it. And um, I, at the time, I was actually studying law and I sort of figured out that wasn't really for me. So I went away and did computer science and physics. And um, I've always said, you know, the computer science started off as a, a vendetta to come back and actually have a crack at this and try and try and solve this problem. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's certainly where it started out from. So I mean, that's, that's an interesting transition to go from law to suddenly building software tools. Can you tell me about, about how that came about? Yeah, funnily enough, um, it was uh, I was talking to some friends uh, that were in the industry, paralegals, you know, just starting their 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 career really, and they were getting ridden out of jobs by software. Um, I ended up actually working with the guy that wrote. Um, wrote some paralegal planning software uh, early on in my computer science career. And so I sort of went away from that and I was like, that's crazy. You know, how can software be not just replacing people, but be making things so much easier for a business yeah. to do what they need to do and reducing the double handling of things as well. Uh, yeah. So that was a, a huge lesson early on for me uh, to take in. And that certainly set me on my, on my way with computer science. So um, the one thing I talk about often in, in, in the tech world is the, the perfect sort of founder team. And it's usually made up of, you know, the technical founder, the person who's got the vision of what they want to do and someone who's really good at selling it. But you've got a, you've got a pretty good team behind you. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've got a fantastic team. Uh, so it consists of myself, uh, Lara Damarison and Samantha Harrison. Um, so I'd say Sammy is probably the more technical sort of person. Lara is the UX focused person. And I sit more in the vision and vision and sales. I also do a lot of development as well. Um, but the three of us together, you know, having a really good technical background and great user experience and design focus uh, certainly helps us build what we believe is a, a really well-rounded product. So you are, you're having this conversation uh, with Carolyn and you're having a glass of wine and she's sort of lamenting as I can, I can just see her in my mind that the fact that you've got to run all this stuff in spreadsheets. I've heard that said before, like you've got two options when it comes to financial planning have a financial planning tool or use spreadsheets and it's always a bit of a toss up as to which is more efficient. But how did you go from, oh, you know what, I might have a crack at that um, to actually where you are now? What was, the, what was the sort of process? Yeah, so the first thing we started off with um, was that all of their stuff and, and a lot of planners probably feel this way, be interesting to hear some feedback later, is that they had stuff all over the place, right? There were data feeds here and data feeds there. There's property values and something different to what insurance policies are in. Things were just everywhere. So what we started off with was building what we called a source of truth was where everyone could pull these things in and put them in the one place so that everyone has a holistic view instead of having to have 16 different tools and uh, portfolios and things open so they can see what's actually going on for the whole business and particularly in a multidiscipline setting. It works great for an individual advisor um, and to keep track of a simpler view, but when in a multidiscipline practice, there's so many moving parts. So that's where we started was that, that singular client view. So it's almost like a CRM dashboard where you're just pulling information from other different areas. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that's, that's where it started. Um, okay. mm. And might as well get it out of the way. MOA stands for? Mother of all spreadsheets, of course. <laughs> Um, I love it, man. When I first heard it, I'm just like, I'm, yeah, awesome. So 
what were the, I mean, that sounds like quite a challenging thing to do. Because, I mean, one of the issues within functional services, you probably well know, is data feeds are terrible. They're inconsistent. They're different. So you, you're sort of pulling in different data from different places. How, how did that work from a practical point of view? Yeah, so from a practical point of view, uh, it ended up the same as what they were already doing. And what I mean by that is that it, it, it was a manual process, right? So either you went and got the values online, <laughs> put them into Excel, put them into a Word document. It was the same thing, right? But then you'd have the problem of, okay, well, I've put it into the Excel spreadsheet, but it's not in the Word document. So then you'd get some inconsistencies between what you're producing. Um, and same thing, same thing with a lot of online tools is the data feeds might not be correct, right? So you end up presenting advice on a value that's just a value that doesn't mean anything. And then you as the advisor are sitting there scratching your head as well, like, well, what is this thing? So the main thing we did was focused on getting the data into that one, one place and albeit a manual process was because the, the data feeds at the time were sort of inconsistent and re unreliable. Uh, they needed updating and checking all the time. Um, so yeah. that's sort of how we began to collate it. Okay. So if you're, you're essentially starting out, like a lot of advisors do that anyway, or they did, did in the past where they're, they're just managing this database, they're putting it all in there and it's almost a manual process. So how did it evolve from there? Like how did you make it into less of a manual process? Yeah, so um, one of our main targets was to start with some uh, uh, financial um, document generation. So okay. our first one was review documents, right? So the idea was we'd take all of this data, put it in the one spot and use that to start generating annual reviews from. Um, so the idea there is that once the data's in and you've added all the loan information, property addresses, those sorts of things, it sits there. And the one right. thing that you should update every year is the value. So it becomes a really simple data update process where you can add, edit, and delete whatever you need so that the document that you're producing is very well informed. Um, so now the update process in a lot of cases is go in, check the values, have a look at them online. Do I need to just paste the value in? Yes, done, and straight into the document. That's, so in other words, you, you've kind of just looked at it and gone, the manual entry thing is, in for many people, one of the only ways of getting the absolute data in and having confidence that it's going to be the right. So we'll, we'll have that up front and then we'll manage the data really well whether, whether, as, you, as you go on. Is that correct? Definitely. Yeah, I think um, what we had to do was design a really good data structure. Um, okay. And to, to put it in layman's terms, right, um, you as a client own assets and liabilities, right? So clients have assets and liabilities. Those assets yeah. and liabilities are broken up into different asset classes. So when you think about it really logically, instead of um, trying to, you know, manipulate individual values to, to feed into what you want, instead you go, okay, well, this is the loan and this is how it's going to be paid off over time and that sort of thing as well. So um, yeah, it was definitely, the manual process of it though was, was exactly uh, what you said, Stu, it was just having to have that confidence about it. Yeah. So why did you choose that? I mean, a lot of people would 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 a lot of financial planning tools of, or tools in general have focused on solving other problems. Integration is one of them. Some people focus on statement advice generation. Some of them are focused on on business intelligence. Why did you choose to go? No, we're just going to focus on reviews or review documentation. Yeah, honestly, I think it's um, the tech background. We're we're very fortunate to come from an industry where there's a lot of uh, broad broad. Um, oh, how to say it? Uh, interests at play, I think. So for example, using an application, you, you need a good user experience so that your users know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so what we had to focus on was making that process easy because primarily what we've seen a lot in industry, and this happens all over the place, is businesses get massive venture capital. They go and get data from everywhere. They, they integrate with big players first, pay them commercial licensing fees, throw the money at them, and they don't have to do anything. It's, it's all up to the people that are building it to then you know, spend the money and get that data there. And yeah. then you've still got the same problem, right? You're still not sure of the data that's coming through. And then on top of that, technically, you can actually auto-generate user interfaces. So not only are you then getting you know, average data, you're then getting a carbon copy of an average user interface. So nothing changes, you know, and it all becomes about the data, which in the 90s worked really well because there was very basic web applications if if web applications even existed right yeah. um and so that's that's transformed a lot in the last 10 years especially user experience and user interaction has become a huge part of the tech industry as a whole so yeah, we're yeah. very fortunate to have lara with great experience in ux ui that helps inform our development 
And that's really, that's really the clincher there is that instead of going and throwing a whole heap of capital at, at data feeds and integrations and just throwing right. money away and auto generating stuff, we're actually focusing on delivering an easy experience for advisors. Do you think the data, I mean, the data feed issue is, is, is massive, right? Um, I've literally had a client, uh, if you're watching this guys, who went down a route with, I'm not going to name names because I don't think that's, that's what this is about. But go down the route, so get onto a tool that looks great, and suddenly their particular provider, which is a fairly big provider, they just can't get the data in. And so suddenly they can't do the review reports, they can't do any of that sort of stuff. Why is the data such an issue for so many businesses out there? Why does it not seem to be shifting? Yeah, I think there's uh, two challenges here. So the first one is that uh, there's this sentiment out there in many industries where you should own your data, right? So probably the limited... Um, Limited exception would probably be something like zero, right? Where your bank feeds almost can't go wrong in that sense, right? It's really yeah. well done. Uh, it's very consistent. It's hardly ever going to change. You're going to have the same stuff all the time. So the challenge there is that with integrations and with data providers, they're free to change their services at any time. So then it's yeah. up to the people that integrate with them to play catch up on that. So if you, you know, throw away all your, all your capital into licensing and commercial APIs, you then have to play catch up on that. So you never get ahead in anything else because you're chasing your tail just for the data. Wow. Um, okay. It's, I'm honest, can I take it back just a sec? Because you guys mm-hmm. have come from, am I right in saying you, you, you've not come from a financial planning background per se? Yeah, correct. Okay. So how, when you were going through this process and you're designing this tool and you've got to work out where the data fits and you've got to work out I mean, the structure of a, an advice documentation and there's legislation in there. Did you find that, the fact that you hadn't had that experience was a was a was an impediment, or was it actually helpful not to not to get invested in the data itself? That's a really good question. Um, I think it was actually beneficial. So all of us, the three of us, were, were were all receiving advice. We're all clients, right? Mm. So at the same time as we were working uh, with Carolyn to to format this document and get the compliance and structure correct, we were like, well, this is what we actually want to see, right? We yeah. we want to see how our financial position and our financial journey is, is changing and progressing over time. Uh, so I think it had a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a mutual benefit there. Ironically, I'm about to start a master's in applied finance. So there goes the, the no background, right? Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it definitely helped because as clients, we could say, well, this is actually what we want to see. We don't want an 80 page document with 10 pages of Excel spreadsheets showing portfolio growth over time, right? Like, we actually want to see what where our assets are now and where we started with you guys, you know. That makes total sense. So can we talk a bit about the user experience thing? Because yeah. um, it's huge in, um, it's been huge in, in tech for a while. And I think our industry has probably just started to catch up on it in, in a client experience sense. So very much about how it feels to be part of a business. But user experience, can you, for those who maybe, um, aren't familiar with the definition of what it actually is in, in the tech space. Can you give us a bit of a background? Yeah, absolutely. So user experience is about how users interact with your with, with an application or with anything really. So yeah. um, user, user interfaces are what you use to interact with and user experience is about how easy and how well mapped out business processes are or processes in general are so that the user has a very seamless experience and it's very straightforward for them. And the user in this case being the person producing the documentation. Absolutely, the advisor, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, what are you, you obviously would have gone out and had a look at a lot of other tools or, or platforms. What do you think are some of the common mistakes that we've made in the industry when designing tools to be usable that you've seen? And again, we don't need to mention names, but I just want to, you know, what are the things that you think would show user experience not working? Yeah, so I think this this is a really tech loaded question, and I'll keep it I'll keep it above board. I won't get into the details, right? But what we've built our system in is this thing called React, which is built by Facebook, which is what they build all of their interfaces on. Uh, love them or hate them, their their interfaces and experiences are, are brilliant. This stuff's been around for thirteen years, right? So those people or those businesses and companies that wanted to change have had the opportunity to for a long time. Whether or not they've actually invested in that is, is another question. So I think there's been a big shift in, in uh, what technical resources are actually available yep. and also what the business is focused on, right? So um, 
there's a lot of languages out there in which you can program and write yeah. write applications and all of them have their different benefits and i think now specific now especially right the last five ten years you should be able to weigh up a couple of different options and go well this is a really good way forward and this is quite an easy way to transition um it's very hard with enterprise software to start that transition yeah. but when you're in these modern frameworks changing from that point actually becomes much easier whereas if you cement yourself in one thing you, you it's harder to respond to that change yeah so I, I think i think specifically in financial planning tech there's a couple of businesses that i know that um use some technology with that auto generated uh, user interfacing right so oh well we can't change our user interface because we you, we use it from our api right all the data that we use that makes our user interface when in reality they should be two yeah, very yeah. distinct and separate things it's kind of like i've literally just finished filling out uh, some forms for the bank and i mean you just look at a form and you go for, i mean form creating a forms an art right a good mm. form that flows and so many of them just don't and i i look maybe some of you out there will have been listening and you've used different financial planning tools and you, you all software in general and you're looking around where does this data where should this data live and you find it and you're like it doesn't belong there it should live there somewhere else and it's it's, it's a real problem can i um i i don't think i've asked this but I have please remind me why did you choose to fix uh the review issue and not the statement of advice issue yeah good question so we had to start with the low hanging fruit um I think again a lot of businesses start with the really big picture and doing everything all at once but you know the classic saying is jack of all trades master of none right and especially in a situation where uh you have big capital you have big big investment and a lot of money backing the development of software it's easy to spread out and do a lot of things at once but instead what we wanted to do was really focus on getting one thing right first garnering feedback from that and then yeah. developing the next phase and primarily because there were, there were a couple of technical hurdles right so we had to get the data figure out how to get the data into the document produce yep. the pdf and those are technical challenges in their own right but the reality is is once they're done for one thing it's easy to replicate that in another process so starting with the review that gives us historical data tracking it gives us yep. the document generation and then moving on from there we can start the soa with more complex modeling and different things like that so it's yeah, about yeah. it was about picking the easiest target first and what we could yeah. get a better gain on um but also massive productivity gains for wealthnet as well that was that was a big focus there is with with all the data all over the place it was taking them ages to produce a review yeah that makes sense so let's let's talk about problems because um if you're in the tech space i mean that's that's kind of the first thing you get asked by an angel investor like what problem are you solving and is it a problem that people care about what what is the specific if a business comes in and they are potentially going to get a benefit from from using mars what's the specific problem they're going to be complaining or suffering about suffering with yeah i i think there's two i think there's um the source of truth which is what we started with and then review generation so it's i think it's really interesting depending on the size of the business how many new clients you're bringing on but also how much ongoing advice you have to produce right If yeah. you bring on 40 clients in a year producing 40 documents over the space of a year for new advice, let's assume it's, you know, reasonable scenarios. Yeah. Um then it shouldn't be too difficult, right? There's really good tools out there to do that. But the challenge is the ongoing advice. If you have 800 clients to produce an annual review for, that's a lot to get done regardless of the size of your team. Um so I think primarily those are the two things, being able to have a source of truth and being able to produce ongoing advice really easily. So what do you do if you've got a tool that you're using and you're using it as a source of truth and then you want to use Mars as well how does how does that work Yeah so a lot of a lot of firms get scared off by price and yeah absolutely should because these guys are charging a mozza like I I have never seen pricing this ridiculous in any other industry right $1000 a user <laughs> a month makes no sense to me that's there's no way I get a $1000 of value out of that for me no matter how many documents you're producing it doesn't make sense Yeah. So primarily the way we charge is we charge per group, right? So it's $200 a year per group um to produce any document, store all the data, the whole thing. We don't there's no extra bits and pieces. Whatever is there is there. You can use it all. And the idea there is that it's designed about the group because that's what who you're producing the advice for. So your document production charges should include this cost, right? Um yeah. so the idea is that until we have that statement of advice, we can start onboarding firms to take care of their ongoing advice and then once we have the new advice component sorted 
they can bring everything over. The, the price doesn't change and they can move on. Okay. And what are, what's the data linkages at the moment? Are you, you just keeping it as a, as a sort of, there's no feeds into it or is, how does that work? At the, yeah. At the moment, standalone. Uh, we've got a couple of really good industry connections uh, regarding uh, data feeds. And that's just primarily we need to wait for SOA production to be done so that we can do those, those link ups. We definitely want to do it. There's some yeah. really good bank feeds and data feeds available now. Um, so we're super keen to get into that. But a big API integration like that takes a lot of time. And we've yeah. just, just got to focus on the product first. So. Can you give us a bit of an overview as to how it works from a, um, uh, from, or in terms of the, 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 the benefits that you're going to get as a business if you're currently producing reviews and you use something like this? Yeah, absolutely. So it, I think it depends on how you produce your reviews. We've had some really interesting clients that we've looked at onboarding, but are smashing it you know they've um set up their their one click review Let, let's call it that but uh you know that's a whole other topic so if you're doing that really well that's great um but the productivity gains we got from wealth med were close to 70 percent reduction in time um and they were looking at you know five to seven hours for a very comprehensive annual review and now we're looking at an hour and 30 you know so being able to get in take the data that's already there and start generating your document from it gives you a huge productivity gain uh, by charging per group as well, you can have all of your team in there, everyone working on the data together instead of going, oh, well, let's share a license. Oh, we can't be logged in at the same time, that sort of stuff. So it's about having right, right, right. collaborative work as well. Okay. So can you break that down for us? Like seven hours, where was the time being chewed up and, and how, did you how did you manage to knock off five and a half hours? Yeah, predominantly it was data collection. So in a lot of cases, right, you'll have... Uh, if you have an online platform, you'll have your data there and that's great. But if you have to check it, then you might have an hour, two hours of just running around checking uh, platforms, checking insurance policies, all that sort of stuff. So that was the biggest chunk of time. Then it was the collaboration, right? So it was storing those documents in SharePoint, having that distributed, waiting for it to upload. The internet's gone down. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of challenges in there where modern tech solutions should be collaborative. You should be able to see the same data all the changes all in one real time. Um, so there was, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, improvement just from the productivity and, and making things a bit simpler, right? Having things in one place and everyone being able to access it and use it. Do you have it, do you have it open on your desktop? Um, the application, the document, the website. Uh, okay, are you like, I, I, I don't, don't, don't want to jump into sort of a, a feature and benefit, but it'd be good to give a bit of a sense of what it looks like because- yeah, totally. um, the first thing when I had a look at it is the first thing that became apparent, and this is why we spoke about user experience, is how, how clean it was, how simple it was, and how it just made sense. I mean, it, it's something that I, not many times you look as a, as a, a sort of um, someone who's not technically minded and you go, I could probably put that document together. You know what I mean? Do you, can you need me to share screen sharing? Yes, please. That'd be good. All right, let's do that. Uh, there go. Make it. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Over to you. Yeah, it was certainly a enormous challenge uh, to take what is a lot of data and try and present it well. Um, so you guys can see my uh, Stu, you can see the yep. screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. So I've just got the little slider here, just so that everyone can just have a look at a few different things, right? Yep. So the idea is that you've got your regular menus and some sub tabs and finding specific data, that sort of stuff. But the whole concept was being able to take a lot of values and make them useful. So instead of just listing like liabilities and then a total at the bottom, like an Excel spreadsheet, you know, we have yep. the benefit of being able to do charting just off any value. Yep. So it's about displaying information and about conveying the meaning of that data through some modeling, right? And really easy to understand and interpret modeling. Um, yep. So a good example here is long-term progress. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So these clients have been, uh, at the firm for seven years, six, seven years. Yeah. And that's their progress over time, right? And that's the trajectory, the target that they're aiming for, which is probably like a retirement goal. You need uh, passive income. So you need an asset base to produce that income. Um, so, so, and this, this essentially you're doing what a lot of advisors do anyway, which they track a lot of stuff in, in spreadsheets. And yeah, which is, and you're putting it into a format which is more industrial, more visual, and ultimately, it's kind of like, it's, it's not trying to automate the process, but it's just making it a lot more robust. 
Is that correct? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of online tools out there that replicate Excel. And why would you bother? Excel, it's, it's a Microsoft-based uh, solution. It's been around forever. It does its job great. Don't yeah. put Excel online. No one wants Excel online. The point is that when you have the option to make a web application, you have to be able to go, okay, well, how can we take the same data structures and implement it in yeah. a different way? Because what these are are business processes, right? If you are producing a review, generally that's a process that goes from start to finish, right? It's not an Excel spreadsheet that pumps out documents for you. Um, so it's about taking those processes, implementing them in a, in a web application and making it very fluid as well. And um, it's, it's interesting to see, like, how do you track? So if I'm an advisor, I'm sitting down and I, I, set, it, I set up my clients. So I bring on board my client, I give you advice and then it come out for review. So I go in and I set up, their profile in the review tool is that correct mm -hmm. and i basically produce the initial review report by the way typically in your model are, 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 is the review report being given before the appointment during the appointment or after the appointment i believe most of the time it's delivered during the appointment so <laughs> advisors produce it before print it out bind it all that sort of stuff and go in with it cool and there's a whole discussion that's going on about progress so obviously the first discussion is or first review predominantly your you're looking at the last 12 months, but you're kind of setting expectations as to this is how we're going to track your progress. This is what it's all about. It's not necessarily about returns. It's about long-term progress, so to speak. And then- Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Keep going, keep going. No, absolutely. I was just going to agree. And then in year two or year, year two, I'm coming back. What am I, as an advisor, am I going in and then updating the information or putting another data point in? How does that work? Yeah, so what happens is um, th this graph's a really good one for it. So uh, the client has assets and liabilities and those values are uh, related, are translated into um, totals for the review. And so that's what's charted on here is net wealth versus total wealth, right? So that's a, a sum of all of those totals. So what that looks like is, yeah, where's my picture? Here we go. Yeah. So property asset totals. So those are investment properties. You have your home, uh, you have investment assets, super assets and loans, right? So the important thing there is that uh, at the moment with our reviews, it's all about progress, like you said, and long-term progress. So saying yeah, yeah, yeah. this is where we've started from, this is where we're going, and this is how our advice achieves those goals. And what our new, new advice process will contain is the more detailed modeling. So individual portfolios, right? Because um, okay. sometimes you, you really do need that analytical modeling for that. Okay. And so, yeah. Keep, no, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So, so the point is being able to say, okay, well, yes, your portfolio has done really well, but actually in the investment properties have been the, the biggest makeup of that, that move, right? So property values have gone up. We're going to increase rental prices. And there's, there's different things you can do and justify based on these values. And that's the whole point of informing the advice is saying, well, because of these changes in your, your financial position, this is what we recommend. Okay. So let me just sort of circle back. You've got a business, if you're a business who you, you may use other tools out there, we might just, uh, you may use other tools out there. So you're not, you're not really wanting to, um, I'm just going to stop. Can we turn that off for a sec? Yeah, totally. Cool. So you're not necessarily wanting to replace your software tool or your, you know, your, your core financial plan tool. You've definitely, you're delivering a high volume of reviews, which are currently taking a lot of time. You're probably pulling data out to put it into spreadsheets or Word documents potentially there's errors coming up. You're having to transfer things left, right, and center. Your, your, your review documents tend to be, um, they're not necessarily showing progress. They're not tracking, you know, this is your net wealth. This is how much this has gone up. They're kind of just taking a point in time or in order to show that progress, it's getting, it's difficult to do. Mm. And you've probably got businesses who are just, there's a lot of complexity in the way they're doing. They're trying to get data feeds from left, right, and center. And they're finding that it's not working. Those are the kind of businesses who, would look at this and go, they're going to get potentially an ROI from, from the tool. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Have I missed anyone out there that, that you work with or is that pretty much it? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. We're, we're just starting to expand. So we've got some, um, some bigger firms we've been talking to at their, you know, classic hanging out for the new advice. Um, but we're getting some feedback from them on the existing document and moving along yep. with that, which is great. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where we're at the moment. So, uh, so focus on that. can we talk about implementation? Cause that's the big thing, right? You, when, when you make a decision, oh, this is awesome. I want to get involved in this tool. You sign on the dotted line and boom, the, the, the really hard work bits comes where you actually have to, you have to implement it. 
how do you implement this within a business? Yeah, great question. So a lot of a lot of online tools will do massive data imports. They'll charge you a fortune for it. We don't want to do that at all. We're happy to do some data imports and work with you to get all of your clients in if you want to jump on. Best way to do it is get in contact with us, sign up, and you can start adding one client at a time and going from there. Uh, that way, you know, you start with one client, you get a good understanding of how that works yeah, for yeah. that one person. And you can start growing from that. I, I remember we spoke about that. I really like this model, whereas you might have 200 clients, but if you're just seeing 10 clients for review in that month one, you pay for 10 clients. If you need 10 the next month, you pay for an additional uh, 10 that month. And if you then decide you don't want to use it anymore, you, you, you kind of, you stop it there. But in other words, you can kind of start to build up the ROI as you go. It's a really smart way of doing it. Yeah, I think it's a big, a, a big difficulty um, because if you take all of your client base, like if you're, a, if you're a larger firm and you've got a thousand clients and you move them across to something and you start paying for that on day one, you don't even know how it works. There's not much yeah. point, right? It's, it's very difficult to get that moving. And then you've got the business disruption of having to get everyone on board to that one thing. Uh, so it's, it's quite a challenge. I think that needed a, a different approach as well. How do you get the data out? Yeah, we, we can do a CSV export, um, has all the assets and liabilities and see you later. That's, that's totally fine. Why, why is it so hard to get data out of most software systems? Is it, it's, is it deliberate or is it just they don't think about doing it? They don't want you to leave. Um, they, they totally don't. I think um, it also has a lot to do with data structure. So getting all of the data in a um, you know, poorly put together data structure is hard. Right, you can't just say, "Get me this client group and let me pull it out." A lot of the time, you have to get the client group, then get their assets, then get the portfolios, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that makes um, sense. And a lot of the time, it's a manual process where someone will go into the database directly. Whereas, if you've got a good API, which is the thing that gives you the data from the database, you should be able to just say, "Hey, give me all of these groups," and off I go. Um, I want to, I'm going to ask a question in a moment. I want to flip around to where you guys are going and I want to talk a bit about the future. I want to get your opinion on coming from outside as to what the opportunity is, where you think the big um, changes are going to be in the next few years. But I wanted to ask about the look and feel of the document because a lot of the time, um, I understand, like practices, you want your documentation to look good. You want it to reflect your brand. And often when you get stuck into messing around with templates and you, it, it, it's just, it's, it's like trying to code, it's like trying to code a web page and you don't even know that there's HTML in the background. You're like, why is there a double space there? What, what the hell? Um, how have you approached that? Like the fact that practices are going to want to make it look a certain way. They're going to want to use certain fonts. They're going to want to put certain images there. Yeah, great question. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. So we've got a, um, just an example group. Uh, can you see that okay, Stu? Uh-huh. Awesome. Uh, so this is what the document looks like, right? So all custom colors, custom branding. Yep. Um, and it's simple. You upload a photo for your, for your logo, for your background, as you would with any setting on any other online platform. Yep. Uh, you can add some standard text. So AFSL, licensee number, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you can put that in. You can put in um, FSG links per employee, and it all just feeds straight in based on who's giving the advice. Yep. Um, yeah, so at the moment, we have a very structured document with different stylings and obviously the advisor brings the comments and recommendations that give the advice, right? Yeah. And what we're looking at doing is as we go forward, once we've done the SOA is making this a dynamic document, right? So what I mean by that is being able to go, actually, I want this down here and being able to just drag and drop that and move that around. Obviously that's the long, that? okay. yeah, that's the long-term vision for how we want documents to be made. And yeah. by, at the moment, it's quite a process, right? So you, you check the data, you add the comps and recs, check your modeling, and there's the document. What we want to be able to do is go straight into the document, move the models around, move the wording around, yeah, change yeah. the wording in here, and have people working on the document together. So that's, oh that's the, yeah, that's, that's the end goal. And um, there's some great implementations of how people have done that out there in, in different industries, accounting as well. There's some excellent applications that have really great collaborative document production. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely where we're heading. Beautiful. Uh, and again, again, we had um, Lara sit down with Carolyn and plan out what a, a document should look like and what we wanted to see as clients as well. And being able to say, well, you know, this makes sense. And we want clients to read the document. We don't want to give them 80 pages, like a set of spreadsheets and yeah. analysis. We want them to be able to go, okay, these are the goals that my, that I've discussed with my advisor. Um, this is the journey that I'm on. 
And this is how that's looking over time. And being Have able you, to click. Sorry, keep going. No, you're right. I wanted to ask, because I know um, we both made our self-licensed business. And I, I heard someone talk, you say it beautifully the other day. It was like, the benefit of self-licensing is you get to control your own quality assurance process. If you're not comf- if you're not confident in your ability to, sh- to to put the rubber quality stamp on your own work, then you shouldn't do it. But if you if you are, then it's a great way of doing it. Like, have you come? Ha- ha- have you hit any problems with licensees with this yet? Yeah, interesting. So a couple of the firms that we've spoken to are uh, large licensee firms, and that's fine. You know, it's some of them have a very interesting approach where they want a one click review, where they take the data feed value, just throw it in, and just send the document off, right? That's a position statement. That is not a, a review. If you're not providing advice, it's not a review, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and I think the reason that they want that process is so that the licensee can go, oh, great, these guys are producing so many more documents. We're making way more money and we can send it off to our quality assurance team that can stamp it themselves. And because that's what you do with a licensee, right? Is you, you sort of negate the risk. You sort of allow someone else to manage the risk a little bit, right? Let's, yeah, that's, that's- so. Yeah, so I think that's that's part of the challenge. And being able to tackle that well is a whole nother thing. Um, if you're self-licensed, you could absolutely use this. If you are in a licensee position where you have some of that control over your quality assurance, you can totally use this. Um, there's metrics and reporting on reviews and analytics and how, how, how many you're producing, uh, what your advice agreements are totaling to, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that I think that fuels part of the licensee process. So... We haven't had any challenges yet because we haven't had any licensee clients, primarily because it's difficult to, to navigate that when, when the licensee just wants you know, control over what they're using, which yeah. fair enough, right? Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's a difficult situation because a lot of licenses are just, they're trying to keep the bigger picture, they're trying to keep the broader network safe. Like everyone's very aware of what happened with Dover, for example, which was you know, a few, few challenges in there. But um, uh, yeah, the, the, the issue is, and you're going to see it with what's going on with individual licensing. Ultimately, I think as the standard of, of systemized businesses goes up, as the standard of, of I probably I, you know, get gone too far, where the, a lot of advisors are now thinking in compliance terms rather than advice terms, because that's what they've been fed to. But I, I definitely think, um, hopefully over time, more, more licensees are going to start to realize that... Um, they're not going to be able to create the best process and they're not going to be able to monitor um, as well as, you know, businesses being able to assure themselves. But, uh, Hey, I wanted to, um, by the way, guys and girls, if you, hopefully this is, this is useful. I'd love to know. So if you've got any questions or yeah, I'd love you to let me know what's the most interesting thing that you've got from it. Cause I know TJ, you probably want a bit of feedback as yourself being, being you know, where you are in the, in the startup journey. Yeah, totally. If you guys are like, this looks great, but you know, no one, we don't want to change. Go for it. Let me know. Uh, you yeah. know we're happy to feed any feedback and, and discuss anything. You know, we're, we're certainly, we're still moving along in our journey and we're still going to the new advice no matter what. So yeah, feel free to comment, shoot us an email, jump on the website and yeah, get in touch if you, if you really want some questions answered. That's the one thing, you know, when you're dealing with a tech startup sort of mentality, they want you to criticize it. They want you to tell them what you don't like. Whereas if you're dealing with a big established software player they they want you they'll they'll listen to your criticism and tell you why you're wrong mm, so, um, absolutely let's talk about where you guys are going because this is um i wouldn't say it's early stage but it's you're definitely at the beginning of something and i love the way you just focus on the low hanging fruit where do you want this to go over the next you know this 12 to 24 months yeah great question so we've um we've just finished our advice agreement process and that integrates with the review. You can have them stand alone, of course. When then looking at uh, fee disclosure, so attaching platforms and platform fees to different asset types. And then after that, moving on to uh, really advanced financial modeling and uh, statement of advice. And reason being that we're doing it in that, that order is that each one of those will build into and complement the statement of advice. Not only does it help the review now, but it will also benefit the statement of advice um, so ideally, ideally late this year, early next year, we want to have the SOA process and new advice process completed. And we'll be holding some webinars and talks and conversations with some firms to discuss how that might work for them and how it might look and feel. And then, yeah, I think 24 months, we might start looking. Well, so after the advice process, we might start thinking about integrations and how that might work. Yep. And also that more dynamic document generation that we're talking about. 
And the um, reason we want that dynamic generation is we've dealt with multidiscipline practices, right? So we want the finance guys to be able to go and produce a, um, a credit proposal for a new loan application from the same data that you're providing advice from because that uh, makes sense, right? Yeah, totally. Because um, both men are multidisciplinary, so that would make total sense. Yeah, and, and same for accounting. You know, there's there's a lot of great accounting tools out there for businesses. I think for individuals, trusts, SMSFs, it's a bit more difficult. Yeah. So we want to be able to provide position statements, um, balance info, contributions, all that sort of stuff around specific entities as well. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's our grand picture there is being able to get the new advice up within the next 12 months, looking at integrations and focusing on that dynamic document generation. Uh, what did I want to ask? I wanted to ask, um, this is kind of in my head. Well, yeah, how does it, so I don't know, is, is the pricing on your website? Yeah, the pricing's on the website. So it's uh, per active group per month. I okay. know there's a lot of pers in that. But the reason being is that you can have leads and, and archive clients that you're not, you're not providing advice to. And the whole purpose of that is that you still need the information that you're not producing documents. Um, so yeah, pricing's on the website. At the moment, it's 1650 per active group per month. And obviously, early adopters, uh, we're happy to work with you. We're happy to uh, look at, um, you know, a free tier really until you've got X amount of groups as well, and yeah. and work with you to get that feedback. Um, we've got some great firms that are really keen on getting started in the next couple of months, and that's going to be about taking on their feedback and working with them to expand our offering. So if you if you're interested in providing that feedback and getting involved, yeah, definitely get in contact with us. If someone gets on board with it now. And then you start to roll out the statement of advice stuff, the service agreements, FDS. Are they, is it going to similar sort of pricing? Is it going to lock it in, or is it going to be increases? How does that work? Have you come? Uh, same, yeah, same pricing. There's no reason to change. You know, the, the product is the product. You're, you're paying for what we provide. So yeah, it's whatever we yeah. develop in future, it should be the same thing. Beautiful. Um, what I wanted to sort of get a picture of. Let's talk a bit about the future. I mean, that's. Oh, by the way, if people want to actually take you up on that offer, what's the best way to to go about it? Yeah, the best way to contact us is via info at moasapp.com, M-O-A-S-A-P-P. -P. Uh, otherwise, jump on moasapp.com and we have the big inquire now button right on the front page. Uh, so yeah, feel free to info, uh, email through or jump on the website and get in contact that way. Love it. Where do you see technology going in the industry over the next few years? Oh, Stu, now we're getting into the good stuff. <laughs> so... Um, you know, the reason I started the Applied Finance Masters is one of the, the last subjects is robo-advisory and yeah. actually building a robo-advisor. Now, there's two different things here, right? There's robo-financial advice and then there's robo-advisory. So think of Wealthfront in the States. They have yeah. an AI that manages $25 billion in funds, right? And it's just a portfolio that runs itself. There's no human interaction with it at all. It's crazy. So that I think not, it's being able to take... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy, right? And there was a, I can't remember the firm, but there was a firm in Australia, I think, that actually tried applying AI to advice documents and then it kept producing the same documents. So it went kaput. I can't remember what they're called, but that was a, so I think there's, I think technology, right, is, is, is on this brink and it, it's the same with Tesla. And this is a really big, um, a bit of a dicey call is that you have to have a few things go wrong so that you can figure out how to do it better. I think being able to learn from that in industry is very important. So looking yeah. at the robo advisors and going, this is what they're doing right. And looking at the robo advice and saying, well, you know what, actually producing automated advice might not be the best way to go about yeah. it, right? Automated modeling, because it's all based on this, is pretty straightforward. So I think, I think as well, the landscape for advice in Australia is changing massively. There were 5.6 million people looking for advice last year. There was a record drop off and decline since the uh, since the Royal Commission and advisors from year to year, from last year to this year. Uh, this is all on advisor ratings as well. So, you know, we're looking at less advisors, increased demand. So how do you manage that, right? And the best way to manage that is by having really good processes and great tools. Um, but I think also the future looks like where having advisors almost as an intermediary, I know that sounds a bit far-fetched, but being able to deliver a client jumps onto a website, right. And goes, I need some advice Yeah. and being able to have someone help facilitate that. And I think this is a, a big part of the client experience that a lot of advisors miss out on uh, or, or are missing a trick on, I should say, is that when someone comes to your website, they want, you know, instant feedback. They want to just have a chat. 
and see what's going on where, and this is where sales becomes a huge part of it. And you see it in tech where sales and support staff are the, one of the biggest uh, sectors within the company because it's about the client interaction and making and, and understanding what they want and being able to determine how you can deliver that. So I yeah. think, I think almost removing the intermediaries between client and, and the advice being given, whether that's the advisor or not, is, a, is another question. Um, but I think, I think AI and tech will only facilitate that and facilitate uh, access to advice, you know, because less advisors, more clients seeking advice, you have to be able to account for a large growth there uh, without people getting involved in the middle. And that's the most tricky part. Yeah, it's also like advice is still um, in many areas. It's one of these things that it can, it can feel really intimidating to people who are outside it. And technology has traditionally been able to remove some of that intimidation by, by giving the user the ability to, to control the pace of the engagement. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a really interesting um, business. Uh, they, they went, went, went over the US last and presented, they were presented to us, Personal Capital. Mm. They've got a fascinating model whereby you can go to the website and you can get access to free, uh, like basically personal finance tool. And then when you're inside and you link together all your accounts, there are all these little tools, financial mapping and analysis tools. So you can start to say, well, what if I save more money? And in the background, there's this marketing engine that's just sending out these little nudges. Hey, did you know you could do better in this space? And it's all positive marketing. There's no pain-based marketing. And then you've got this tool. It's linking together. You're starting to ask yourself questions about how it can improve. And the bottom corner there is click this button to be linked via Zoom to your financial advisor. And literally the moment you click the button, you're connected to the 160 odd advisors they've got in Delaware, which is where the uh, College of Financial Planning is. And boom, this person sitting in front of you, you're having a conversation, and then uh, you pay, you know, the, the 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 for the upfront advice, and then you you become an ongoing client. So it's kind of this, this, this almost um, uh, this 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 journey which starts with technology, which starts with you working with your numbers, asking questions, and then boom, at some point when it gets difficult. Or at some point where you're like, oh, I, I need that human level of interaction, you're introduced to the advice relationship at exactly the right time. It's a beautiful model and I, I, I'd love to see it. But man, I, I couldn't agree with you more on so many different points. TJ, this has been awesome, man. I really pr- appreciate it. I, I really enjoy going in in the back of this stuff and not just talking about features and that my, my tool can do this, my tool, but, but sort of understanding where you guys have come from the specific problem, the, the use case, and, and, and most importantly, how, how to implement the damn thing. That's really, that's where the rubber hits the road. Mate, any last thoughts or is there anything you want to sort of say to anybody who's watching this and, and, and sort of wants, wants a bit more? Yeah, I think, I think even if you're just interested in the client experience that um, your clients are receiving and you're, you're thinking about that and how, what, what more you can provide to them and, and give to them and help them, uh, I'd absolutely love to chat about it and discuss it. Um, and and even, even having another session like this or something like that, it's yeah. a great place to discuss those things because ultimately that's what it's going to become. And like that model in Delaware, right, where it's all about the client and the client's experience and cl- compliance becomes part of it, right? And ASIC's, ASIC's a classic, right? They, they want you to show the client what they want to see. And well, how yeah. do you know what the client wants to see, right? So it's, I think, finding that happy medium where, yes, you're providing the advice, but all the, the detail is, is in the appendices and the document that you present is just about what relates to the client and then also improving that experience with your business. You know, I think uh, that's a, it's a great philosophy, the, the client experience and client journey. Yeah, I, I think it's a big area. I think COVID got in the way of a lot of businesses were going down the client experience route. COVID came along and just kind of smashed everything for a little while. But I reckon if, if client experience is something you're interested in, uh, if Lara does your client experience, is that correct? Yeah, Lara does all of our UX. Uh, she's lara at moasap.com. So feel free to shoot yeah. some questions to her as well. I, having seen what Lara, Lara's created in the team, obviously, but I, I have a feeling that if you had questions about how, what's the best way to do this, she's probably going to give you about 10 ideas you, did, you didn't think about and improve it in, in, in ways. So yeah, if that's something people are interested in, um, taking uh, up the offer on lara at moasapp.com.au uh, just dot com beautiful tj this has been awesome what do you got planned for the weekend man oh man we've, we've got a busy one we're going down to sanctuary cove for the international boat show we're uh, going out yeah. to lunch uh, it's all happening this weekend so enjoy that i think greg's there as well isn't he i think he might be yeah yeah well enjoy enjoy your new airpods i've got my um 
my remaining one soaked, wet, broken AirPod. But um, man, thank you so much. And and for those of you who stayed till the end, thank you. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, reminder, you can shoot them through to um, uh, TJ at info at moasapp.com. If you want to chat about uh, UX or client experience, it's lara at moasapp.com. And of course, if you're interested in, in talking about whether or not you can adopt this in your business and solve a review problem, solve a data problem, then, then you know, head over to moasapp.com and check it out or just drop them an email. Mate, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, no doubt we will speak very, very soon. Fantastic. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, guys. See you, everyone. Have a good one. See ya. Bye.